Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. The contemporary novelist Philip Kerr once wrote, atheism is like standing up to the mafia. There's safety in numbers. <laughs> Tonight, I feel very safe. <laughs> now, um, that was a delightful introduction, but I'd just like to make a more complete introduction for those of you who don't know me. As far as I can tell, I'm Australia's only six-foot ex-Mormon, lesbian, comedian, atheist, and diabetic. <laughs> Thank you. Although, actually, I feel the much more accurate labels are uh, geek and nerd. And I should point out that the reason I'm drinking beer on stage is not out of disrespect for your good selves. It's a medical necessity. <laughs> I did mention I was a diabetic. Well, when I was diagnosed, there was a big drama about how to keep my blood sugar levels level during performing. After much experimentation, turns out, sipping a beer quietly through the show <laughs> does the trick. Thank you. It comes with the added bonus of making my beer tax deductible. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure that may be the holy grail of the Australian psyche. <laughs> because every time I've used that term on stage, men have gone, oh, tax deductible. It's a beautiful thing, beautiful thing. Now, the, the title I gave this talk I'm doing tonight in the program is uh, called 20 Years of Kitten Kicking God in the Shins. Although I should tell you the original version was 20 Years of Kicking God in the Nuts. <laughs> but um, I decided maybe that was a bit too rude for the program and it's probably very much affected by the fact I'm a big fan of South Park. <laughs> Any other South Park fans in? <laughs> See, basically, for more than 20 years, me and God, we've been doing the Rochambeau. <laughs> I kick him in the nuts, then he kicks me in the nuts, then I kick him in the nuts. And I'm not sure, but I think Cartman may be God. <laughs> Just quietly. He has the appropriate psychoticness. Because, you know, this, this, this God of the Old Testament, he's, he's very fond of the how much do you love me games. And sometimes I can just hear Cartman going, do you love me? Do you love me enough to kill for me? Respect my authority! <laughs> you go to hell and you die! <sighs> Tell ya, Cartman is God. Just a work in theory. And also, up front, I'd just like to say, because I did a bit of mingling in the foyer during the canapes and drinks, and having gone to many uh, Mormon conferences in my life, I'm here to tell you the level of attractiveness here, much higher. <laughs> Although, to be frank, the bar wasn't very high. <laughs> if you've ever met many Mormon men, you'll know why I'm a lesbian. <laughs> so basically, I've been doing comedy uh, for 20 years, and for 20 years I've been trying to kick God in the nuts pretty much. Um, and it was almost inevitable that I would get a career as a comedian in that, having grown up Mormon, born and bred Mormon, I was gifted with material. <laughs> they gave me my first 20 minutes worth of material. My whole career grew out of telling stories to people at parties about the Mormon church and them going, ah, my God, you've got to be kidding, ah! <laughs> Let me just give you a quick run through of some of the weirder Mormon beliefs. God and Jesus are two actual physical beings who live on a planet called Kolob. <laughs> it's way out past Pluto and we can't see it because there's a force field around it. <laughs> I would also like to point out that Kolob spelled backwards is bollock. <laughs> Also, in between the crucifixion and the resurrection, Christ was not in heaven, he was not in hell. Where was he? He was in America. <laughs> he spent those three days preaching to the Indians. Not only that, the Garden of Eden was in Jackson County, Missouri. <laughs> According to the Mormon Church. 
They've actually bought up all the land there because that's where Christ is going to gather the faithful of the second coming. Um, I also, because I was in the church for almost 19 years, I also did proxy baptisms for the dead. Because I don't know if you know, but if you're interested at all, you can't get into heaven until you've had a Mormon baptism, which is why they're doing all this genealogy. You know, you want to research a family history, you always end up bumping into Mormons because it's their plan to baptise everyone in the entire world. And I've done a hundred of them. So I don't know if there's a hundred happy souls in heaven because I got baptised for them and they're there and then when I became a lesbian they got thrown out. (laughs) Sometimes late at night when I have Mormon flashbacks I worry that they'll come for me. Not only that, I think the most ridiculous piece of Mormon theology, um, if Mormon men are very good and behave themselves very well, after they die, if they get to top Mormon heaven, because by the way, there's three, yeah, three, (laughs) Americans, always bigger and better, (laughs) not just one heaven, three. If they get to top Mormon heaven, they can go on to further study and become gods themselves. and have their own planet and their own creation. Which means there is a possibility that at some point way in the future, someone may get to heaven and find out that God is Donny Osmond. (laughs) Or even scarier, one of my brothers. Because that'll be a creation of horsey bites and Chinese burns. Oh, they never stop. Ah, so basically, you know, professionals have messed with my mind for a very long time. And not just Mormons, actually. I, I would like to bring your attention to something that I've been calling Operation Warp the Kiddies Fragile Little Minds, which most of Western society, even if they're not Christian, help to conduct. Um, basically, what I'm talking about here is Santa Claus, the East Bunny, the Tooth Fairy, and God. We all let the kiddies grow up believing that they're all real. <laughs> if he gave me more money, maybe I would. But it, isn't it interesting? There are four mythical beings, and basically, the one that gives you nothing is the one that's real. <laughs> Santa Claus gives you presents, the Easter Bunny gives you chocolate, Uh, Tooth Fairy gives you cash, I'm sorry, three of the best things that humans want, (laughs) cash, chocolate and presents, cool, and what does God give you? Nothing, guess what, he's the real one, ha ha, (laughs) which means that at very early age we are fucking with these kiddies minds, we are telling them to discount evidence, we are telling them to ignore their senses. It's like, oh, there's evidence for these. No, 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 just ignore that. It's God. He's the only one that's real, darling. I don't think so. So anyway, it, it has been a very odd career. I've done many weird and extraordinary gigs and probably oh, nothing more extraordinary than this, I think. I believe I am still the only comedian to have performed for the Sydney Gay and Lesbian Mardi Gras and the World Council of Churches. <laughs> in the same week. (laughs) I wasn't surprised by the invitation from Mardi Gras, but when the World Council of Churches rang, I was like, are you sure? (laughs) (laughs) Have you got the right comedian? Do you know what I talk about? Uh, mm, Fair enough. And obviously I'm still really mm, very mm, scarred scarred by my Mormon upbringing because, you know, you try and fight it, but there's always a little residual Mormon in the back of your brain that you, no matter how hard, you just can't quite kill it. And it has manifested in an obsession with a religion that I just can't quite let go of, you know. It's like tangling with the tar baby in the bri- briar patch, you know. Um, it has led me to do incredibly stupid things. I uh, once auditioned for the part of Mary Magdalene in Jesus Christ Superstar. I gave what I thought was a very realistic rendition of I don't know how to love him. (laughs) What to do? How to please him? Wouldn't have a clue. (laughs) Have to ask a straight girl. (laughs) 
And I don't know if anyone else um, noticed, I, th this totally blew my mind. It was probably about 15 years ago now, there was a very tiny article about this big in the age that said that the Church of England had officially abolished hell. <laughs> they just got rid of it. And me, the thought of eternal damnation, torture and red hot pokers up the arse wasn't playing too well with the punters. <laughs> so they legislated it out of existence. <laughs> I have questions. <laughs> Many questions. Where did they go? <laughs> they got rid of limbo, they got rid of purgatory. I assume it was a mass upgrade to heaven. Wouldn't that have been an interesting day to be in heaven? <laughs> As all these people who've been tortured and red hot pokers up the ass for hundreds of years are suddenly thrown into heaven going, what the fuck was that? I'll have you some Peter, I'll have you. <laughs> anyway, and I saw, I, I think it's really rude to change the rules of the game halfway through the game being played. I'm sorry. Very wrong. And the thing is, I was thinking about this, okay, so they've got rid of hell, they've got rid of limbo, they've got rid of purgatory, most religions have got their head round that women are fully human and have a soul. That took a while. Some religions have even got their heads around the fact that gay and lesbians are you know, really actually sort of okay. You know, maybe in 50 years no one will bat an eyelid at gays, lesbians and gay priests and whatever. Maybe it'll, everyone will just be over it, and I find that interesting and a little confusing, because I don't know about you, I never pictured God as being on a learning curve. <laughs> huh? You'd pretty much think that an immortal omnipotent, omniscient being would have it sorted it out millennia ago, not suddenly turned around and go, oh, actually, you guys are all right. Sorry about that. <laughs> I'll get Mary in with a broom later to clean up the mess. <sighs> so, with all this you know, ongoing obsession and scarring with religion, imagine my delight when I was, in fact, invited to Salt Lake City, Utah. <laughs> to speak to a whole bunch of gay and lesbian Mormons. What could I do except call the ABC and say, get me a film crew, this is going to be a mindfuck. <laughs> if you're lucky, you'll get a complete nervous breakdown live on telly. <laughs> I tell you, we came this close. Um, the whole experience is recorded in this book, uh, which I will be selling tomorrow, but if any of you aren't going to be here tomorrow or can't wait, I've got a few copies with me now. <laughs> I am shameless. It is called The Confession of an Unrepentant Lesbian Ex-Mormon, which is nothing if not an honest title of a book. It's, uh, it was a wild and, and scary ride, and I won't talk too much about it because it's all in the book, but one thing I did do was take advantage of the opportunity of being in a room full of ex-Mormons and some still practicing Mormons and just check some theology with them to find out you know, some of the things my mother told me, if it was real or just what my mother made up. Because I don't know about other religious mothers, mm, they lie. <laughs> so I got to check with these people whether it was really true, as my mother told me, that on judgment day your pets will be given voices so that they can give evidence against you. <laughs> I still lock the cats out of the bedroom. <laughs> Even nastier. Last time I saw my mother, they, uh, it was very intense and emotional, and we don't talk anymore, and she was sort of gripping me like she was trying to burn my image into her brain because one of the nastier Mormon beliefs is that 
If you're in heaven and not all your family has made it, that's going to depress and upset you and that's not what heaven's about. So they will wipe their memories of any recollection of the family members that didn't make it. <laughs> you're not as funny as you think. <laughs> Okay, but the one thing I really want to check with them, because this, this had enraged me a few years before, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. My mother had brought me up to believe that any naughty thing I did, any little white lie I told, would retrospectively make Jesus suffer more on the cross. <laughs> because he died for our sins, so if I sinned, I was adding to it. Now, I just wanted to check and confirm with them that that is not actually official Mormon uh, belief. That is evidently quite a common little thing that Mormon mothers use to scare the crap out of their kids. And when I had first found this out a number of years ago, see, kids, see, the thing is, like I say, the residual Mormon is still there, even no matter how much I try to kill it. And there have been times over the years where I've done stuff on stage where part of me's just gone, ah, oh, sorry, Jesus. <laughs> That must have really sort of arced it up a bit. <laughs> Sorry, it had to happen. So that little bit of guilt was still nagging away at me. And then I actually, one year, I told my lover about this story and she just looked at me and went, that's crap. <laughs> no religion in the world believes that. And I, I got very angry. And it just so happened we'd had this conversation because it was Good Friday. And I was doing a show in the Comedy Festival. And the, thing, the Comedy Festival always straddles Easter, and they always do shows on Good Friday, and I tell you, they're the weirdest shows going. There's only ever about 30 people there, 30 lonely little atheists come along <laughs> on Good Friday. Although one year, see, I also have this thing where, where, where young teenage gays and lesbians bring their family along to see me, thinking that, you know, I'll make it a bit easier for them. <laughs> And one year, this young Greek girl brought in her grandmother, all in black, who just sat there the whole time. <laughs> so I was performing on Good Friday. I was incredibly angry about what I had just been told. And I turned up at the venue, and there was, you know, like I say, just 30 lonely atheists. And I did my gig, and right at the end, I finished up by telling this story about you know, how angry I was and all these years. I felt guilty about you know, making Jesus suffer more. And so I finished with, so here's my Good Friday message for Jesus. Squeal, little piggy, squeal! <laughs> You sure got a pretty mouth, Jesus. <laughs> yes, and I delivered it much more angry, and the 30 atheists went, Ugh! That's a bit much even for us. <laughs> and I don't do it too often on stage, and oddly enough, it's a story I didn't tell in Utah. <laughs> but like I say, I am still morbidly fascinated by all this crap, and I, I cannot drag myself away from watching the Christian programming on telly. Because I'm a bit of an insomniac, and let me tell you, the gates of hell open at about three in the morning. <laughs> Some of the pro... Oh, I used to have cable, and they had a, a program, a special Christian program for youth. Gobsmacked, jaw-dropping, befuddled, confused, and angry upon seeing such, such stuff... As a, as a band come on, come on to sing a lovely, delightful, uplifting ditty for the kiddies called I'll Never Be As Good As Jesus. <laughs> and then watch this little Christian punk trying to be a rap guy. And this is word for word what he said at the end of a segment. Hey, and if you want to have faith but you're not quite there yet, why not try pretending for a while? <laughs> Can't do any harm. <laughs> yes, I fucking can. <laughs> Another one with a, with a fiery southern preacher telling people how to confront atheists with the stupidest logic I have ever heard in my life. 
when they say to you that there were dinosaurs 65 million years ago, simply say to them, were you there? <laughs> Do you know how easy it is to flip that around? Moses parted the Red Sea. Were you there? <laughs> Jesus died and suffered for our sins. Were you? You get the point. And the other one, I, I think her name is Joyce Brown. She's on Ameri uh, Australian telly at the moment. She's got the most amazing cat's bum face. I've never seen a more bitter, angry, twisted, tight woman in my life. Again, this is word for word. I, I, I will never forget these words as long as, I've, as long as I live. People come up to me and talk about their feelings. Oh, pastor, I don't feel like doing that. Oh, pastor, but it feels so good. Pay no attention to your feelings. Your feelings are sent to you by the devil. <laughs> what? It must be the drugs. She couldn't have said that. <laughs> but oh, she did. But I tell you what, however bemused, gobsmacked, and outraged and upset I get watching the Christians, I've never actually wanted to punch one. That took a new age person. <laughs> if I could be permitted just one slight tangent, um, those of you who have read my books or have seen me perform will know, um, uh, uh, also on that long list of labels, I'm also um, an incest survivor. I was sexually abused by my stepfather. Don't worry, it was 30 years ago. I'm over it. It's all right. I'm not going to cry. <laughs> cool. Just needed the context. And um, I've talked to my very first solo show, I talked about it on stage. And uh, by, of course, by talking about it, I then opened up the opportunity for other people to talk to me about it. And one night after the show, I got buttonholed by a new ager who proceeded to tell me, oh, your stepfather must love you so much. He must be like your soulmate. You've probably been tied together for so many lives. The fact that he loved you so much that he could incarnate in this role to teach you this beautiful lesson. It's the closest I've ever come to punching someone in the face. I don't think she had any idea how offensive it was. And so I would just like to give to you my very quick 20 second denunciation of the new age. Uh, feel free to use it in public. Um, <laughs> if everything happens for a reason, if everything that happens is meant to happen and everyone is learning a valuable lesson, then the world is perfect. There is absolutely nothing we have to change. Back and bullshit. <laughs> okay, while you're at it, I'll also give you my 10 second Christian denunciation. It's even easier. Uh, everyone forgets Jesus wasn't a Christian, he was a Jew. Christianity started much later with St. Paul. Now, as far as Jesus knew, he was fulfilling Jewish prophecy. The Jews didn't believe him, so why should we? <laughs> this is where I want to hold up a banner going, tee hee hee. <laughs> okay, now I, I want to tell you uh, about my most successful experiment in atheism. I've got to set this up a little bit. Uh, in the mid-90s, I was doing a show with two other comics here in Melbourne at a pub called The Prince Pat, nice, small, intimate little venue. Uh, the promise to the audience was that every week we would do all new material. Nothing would be repeated. And it was my job each week to research and destroy a different religion. <laughs> I had fun. I did the Buddhists, I did Scientology, I, did, you know, I even had a bit of a bash of the Jainists. Look them up later. Um, and then one week, uh, the guy who was directing us said, we're going to have a band on next week, so how would you like to use the band? And I thought, ooh, I can finally run my experiment. 
Because I'd been thinking, I don't do characters in my comedy. I'm just myself and I talk. But the one character I have written is the atheist preacher. Because I thought, how much fun would it be to take all the tricks of the trade that a fiery Southern Baptist preacher uses, you know, the call and response, the, the whispering and the shouting, the threefold repetition, to have a band and a choir behind, you know, all the tricks of the trade that they use. What if I used them all and turned it to atheism? So I wrote this quite, quite wonderful piece, quite frankly. <laughs> and I practiced with the band. They were doing a lot of nice sort of organ work underneath. It was about a 20 minute piece and they worked up towards the end. They were playing, prepare ye the way of the Lord from Godspell, except it was prepare ye the way of the lobster. <laughs> Let me explain. See, I've done this whole thing about people refusing, ignoring this life that we have now. The only one we know we actually have. Putting it off, discounting it and concentrating instead on the next life. The new life, the better life, the perfect life, the life with God. And that to me, that is like refusing a wonderful meal of lobster and saying, no, thank you, I'm waiting for the invisible dessert. <laughs> thank you. So I worked up towards, you know, the whole thing led towards, at the end, basically going, fuck dessert, eat the lobster. <laughs> And it all worked surprisingly well. People were going nuts. And at the end, friends told me that at the back of the venue, there were people actually shouting, Hallelujah, fuck God! <laughs> and I've got to tell you, it was um, as much fun as you get from watching me perform. I have a lot of fun watching my audience sometimes. I love seeing the brains explode. And I was watching carefully that night, and it was the most amazing experience, in that for the first minute, the audience was looking at me going, what the hell is she doing? And then after a couple of minutes, oh, I see, very good. Oh, yes. Very clever, good on you. And then a couple of minutes later, there was a very limp sort of Aussie, amen, sister. Ooh. A little bit embarrassed. <coughs> Forgot I had a lamel mic, sorry. But about 10 minutes in, this weird moment happened where one person let rip, like really got into an amen sister. And it was like it gave the rest of the audience permission because they went nuts, absolutely nuts, screaming, shouting, waving around. And it was the sort of venue where there's no backstage. So when I was finished, there was an intermission. And I walked off stage and threaded my way through the venue to the back where my friends were and had the wonderful experience of watching people shake their heads going, whoa. <laughs> and one guy actually looked at me and said, that stuff works. <laughs> yes. That's why they use it. <laughs> oh, yes. Don't be fooled. It was... Uh, it was a very, very interesting night, and it was a little bit scary to think that, you know, I'm not, I'm a little bit charismatic, but I wouldn't call myself overpowered. But the fact that I could take a room full of strangers with presumably a wide range of beliefs and get them charged up to that extent within 20 minutes, that's what we're fighting. That's the things we were sort of working against. You know, there is a reason that every religion in the world at some point has messed around with cantles, drumming, incense, repetition, chanting. It works. So I think we should use it too. <laughs> I think you guys should sponsor me to get a show together. We'll get a little band, we'll get a little choir, and we'll do us an old-fashioned atheist revival tent show. <laughs> Where's Kath Devaney? Are you in here, Kath? Kath Devaney? No. 
Well, I was going to invite her to tag team preach with me, but obviously she's not watching, so never mind. But I tell you, we've actually got the material. I put a bit of thought into this. I even have a hymn that pretty much everyone in the English-speaking world could join in with, courtesy of Monty Python. <laughs> in case you don't know it. All things dull and ugly, all creatures short and squat. All things rude and nasty, the Lord God made the lot. So, yeah, you know, you, we've got the hymns. Uh, you know, we could do readings from the unholy books of Dawkins, Hitchens, and Huxley. <laughs> In fact, I have a perfect bite side reading here, which I want to use for you tonight because I think it's my favorite atheist quote of all time from Mr. T. H. Huxley. In my book, uh, Shameless Plug Again. <laughs> Man is so intelligent that he feels impelled to invent theories to account for what happens in the world. Unfortunately, he is not quite intelligent enough, in most cases, to find correct explanations. <laughs> so that when he acts on his theories, he behaves very often like a lunatic. Thus, no animal is clever enough when there is a drought to imagine that the rain is being withheld by evil spirits or as a punishment for its transgressions. Therefore, you never see animals go through the absurd and often horrible fooleries of magic and religion. No horse, for example, would kill one of its foals in order to make the wind change. <laughs> Asses do not bray a liturgy to cloudless skies. <laughs> oh, yeah! And you know, I could do healings. <laughs> Although my laying on of hands will be very different to the Christians. <laughs> could you imagine touring a show like that? Could you imagine taking it to America? <laughs> I can almost feel the noose around my neck already. <laughs> okay, now I'm, oh look, I'm, 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 I'm running a little bit late, but there's just a couple of things I wanted to throw at you before I go. I, I, I would like, you know, two weather-related stories or observations. The, the, the storms last weekend, for those of you who don't know, once in a century, huge, massive hailstone. Blah, blah, blah. Could you imagine what the Christians would have said if the conference had been last weekend? <laughs> we would have got the blame. It would have been God's wrath for defending, you know, bringing atheists to Melbourne. You know, the fundies would have taken it very seriously. The media would have played with it as a joke and gone, ooh, maybe we'd better warn other cities not to host the atheists. <laughs> I think we missed a bullet. I think we dodged a PR bullet by having it this weekend. In fact, I am sorely tempted to call it the first atheist miracle. Even though I feel dirty saying it, I just couldn't resist. <laughs> the other weather-related thing, this is to, to annoy your North American friends. Not the Canadians, just the Americans, you know who I mean. Because <laughs> has anyone else noticed that the strip of land across the center of America known as the Bible Belt is also pretty much Tornado Alley? <laughs> it's almost like God is saying to the Christians, fuck off. I apologise for being so crude, but the fact of the matter is God has form in this department. I believe in Genesis it actually says, go forth and multiply. Go and get fucked. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> Come and find me later. It's a bloody good read. It's really good and it's only 20 bucks. What I want to leave you with is one final quote. Um, part of me after 25 years of kicking God in the nuts is, you know, I'm a, I'm a bit over it. I'm a bit over taking it seriously. I'm a bit over arguing. There is no facts and evidence to argue against. What's the point? I think there should be more mocking. Let's just not take them seriously. 
the more seriously you take them, the more authority they have. I say, mm-hmm, fuck yours. <laughs> and in that department, I, I wanted to bring in and mention, I don't have many political heroes. I have two, basically. George Orwell, pretty obvious, thank you, yes. His honesty, his humanism, and the fact that he was always willing to look past labels. I love him. The other one may surprise you. Actually, I think my main political god is the Hollywood actor Zero Mostel. I don't know if you've heard this story, but during the 1950s when McCarthyism was going rampant in America, Zero Mostel was hauled before the House of Un-American Activities Committee, and when they put the question to him, ooh, sorry, echo of the Inquisition, they went, are you now or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? Zero Mostel looked at them, rolled his eyes and said, we're not allowed to tell. <laughs> That's what we need more.